Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 tonight, we'll be looking at 4, 5, and 6 as we continue uh, this good epistle. Good to see everybody tonight and thankful we can all be together to study. Um, We've been looking at uh, sort of the organization of this book just from a chapter outline standpoint. And tonight we'll be talking about in chapter 4, guarding against departing from the faith. In chapter 5, dealing with the family of God, differences in age, gender, economic status, status, spirituality, and all those things. And then we'll be looking at uh, focusing on the gain of godliness instead of material riches in chapter 6. So remember, Paul is writing to his young preacher friend, Timothy, and a lot of this is designed to help him as an evangelist do his work, uh, prepare him to conduct himself in the house of God in the Lord's church and to build up the church as it needs to be done in in the right way. So in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul will say the first five verses, let's look at those as a chunk right now. The Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good. Nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So the Spirit is warning that some are going to depart from the faith in latter times. After Timothy and Paul's time, but it doesn't say how much later, but there's, it's coming that people will depart from the faith. Just expect that. Notice that the Spirit speaks expressly. This is one of the great indications in Scripture that Paul is certainly writing by inspiration. He's not writing his feelings. He's not writing things he he thinks the Spirit's telling him. You know, I felt the Spirit, I'm moved to say this or that. But the Spirit says expressly. This coincides with his description of inspiration in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13, where he says that uh, the, the, the Spirit teaches spiritual things in spiritual words combining spiritual things with spiritual words. So the words themselves are inspired. And so here he says the Spirit is expressly saying this to emphasize that aspect of inspiration. And he's warning that some will depart from the faith. And the way they do that is they're going to give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. It is consistent in the New Testament that that false doctrine and false religion in general is a product of Satan. Uh, that it is he who twists people's thinking and minds uh, away from right to do that which is abominable to God. So these people who depart from the faith, they listen to deceiving spirits, things they think maybe are right, that the world says are right, but they're deceived by that, and these are, he calls them, doctrines of demons. So they speak lies in hypocrisy. I notice that lying and hypocrisy often go hand in hand. Uh, and when people aren't telling the truth, uh, you can easily spot hypocrisy in their lives. That's a sort of something that goes together. So these people speaking lies in hypocrisy, and they have their conscience seared, so much so they, they don't know right from wrong, which is what that's saying, right? If you have your conscience seared, you, you can't really tell, distinguish between right and wrong. Up to this point in First Timothy, Paul has connected having a good conscience with remaining faithful a number of times. And let me just point those out to you quickly. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart and from a good conscience and from sincere faith. The good conscience and the sincere faith coupled together. And then 1 Timothy 5 and verse 19, where he talks about uh, that Timothy needs to have faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. You lose your good conscience You're not true to your conscience, what you know to be right and wrong. You're going to lose your faith along with that. And then you have chapter 3 and verse 9, where he tells Timothy to hold the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. So holding on to faith and the purity of one's conscience are connected together. Let's get this down for the young people. If, If we as young people, old people, whoever we are in between there, are consciously doing things that we know are wrong, and eventually, uh, you know, hardening our hearts and searing our consciences, we will lose our faith. And that's inevitable. So there's the da- besides the danger of you're just doing wrong when you do wrong, when you consciously do that and let yourself be led into that, 
you will lose your faith. I think that's what Paul's warning. Uh, and that's the danger of these false teachers, uh, and that's the problem that they have. Um, some of the specific errors that they would uh, teach, including, uh, would include forbidding to marry. Of course, the first thing we think of there is like the Roman Catholic Church and the clergy, but there are other applications of that. That's the most obvious one. Uh, requiring abstinence from foods, and again, you can think of the Roman Catholic Church there. A lot of religious groups do that, whether they're you know, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, whatever. There's all kinds of religious groups that, that do that. Abstinence from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving. Two things there. God has made the abundance of the earth to be enjoyed by mankind, to be received and be thankful for that. When Peter's on uh, Simon the Tanner's rooftop in Joppa and he sees the sheet you know, lay it down. And the lesson was, of course, that God was going to accept the Gentiles. But uh, a tangent parallel lesson, really, is that God was saying these foods are clean too. I, I've said you can have them. Uh, and I think Peter eventually sort of gets both of those things. Uh, God, God created things to be enjoyed, foods to be enjoyed. And notice every creature uh, God doesn't expect us to be vegetarians. We can be if we want, but that's, he's created things to be received with thanksgiving. Um, and and the, the importance then of the second thing, it's received with thanksgiving. It's sanctified. Remember what the word sanctified means, everybody? Ma made holy, set apart, uh, purified. And so that, that makes it acceptable, whatever it is. If you can give thanks for it and eat it, then it makes it acceptable to you and God. But give, give thanks for it. One of the uh, startling things I, I notice in uh, the gospel accounts is how many times Jesus gives thanks. And I think about that when, especially in, in John 6, you know, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, and he, he, he gives thanks. And later on, John identifies the place as, or the time as, when he had given thanks, you know. Um, he gives thanks for that. He is the maker of everything. He's going to be the creator of that miracle. And yet, he's giving thanks. He takes time to do that. If he did that, I think we should too. Therefore, I think this is a message to get to even young kids. Prayer before a meal is not just sort of a ritual or a nice thing to do. Okay? It's something that God wants us to do. Uh, to appreciate the food we've given. We have the example of Jesus Christ himself. This passage is teaching us everything's good, but we need to receive it with thanksgiving. So it's not just a ritual. Let's be sincerely thankful uh, for our food when we take it. Um, express that to God, uh, regardless of the circumstances that we're in, whether we have much or little, uh, and be thankful for it. So all of those, just, I think, that last part, especially great lessons for young people. Other thoughts uh, there on... That section, first few verses. Yeah. Yeah. He says that specifically then. Exactly. All right. Um, the next section covers uh, almost the. Well, I was going to say it was, it's the heart of. It's not really the heart of, but it's sort of the core message of First Timothy. As all of this is instructing Timothy how to be a good minister of the gospel, an evangelist. But here he gives us characteristics of that good minister. He says, verse 6, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ. So instruct the brethren of what he's just said, and I think what he's about to say as well. Nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. So you're, you're one who's got the good doctrine, you're carefully following it, you share that with others. Uh, you teach these things. That is part of being uh, a, a good minister. A good minister is someone who's going to reject profane and old wives' fables. Um, let me see. Where am I? He will refuse earthly myths or fables as the basis of his doctrine. Uh, you, you know, I, I think a lot of preachers in the denominational world, evangelical world, just kind of get up and preach on Sunday morning of some feel-good story that they've seen in the news or, you know, something, and that's about all they talk about, those kinds of things. And, and it's just pop psychology and culture that people are getting, uh, the current 
social justice craze or whatever it might be. Uh, that's, that's what folks are fed. That's, that's not a good minister. A good minister rejects all of that as the basis for his doctrine. And he's going to take uh, the word of God. He exercises himself to godliness. He, he says, reject the profane and old wives' fables. Exercise yourself toward godliness. Bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Have a promise, having a promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. So let me stop here, and I, I've got the word godliness highlighted. You might want to take a note or two on this. Um, the word godliness is found uh, a total of 16 times in all of the New Testament. Nine of them are in First Timothy. Short little book. Nine times uh, Paul writes about godliness. And I think that's instructive. <laughs> uh, he's focusing on Timothy's godliness. He's focusing on Timothy helping others be godly. A doctrine that accords with godliness. These are some of the concepts that you have in First Timothy. So it's, it's harped on virtually in these uh, six chapters. Nine times godliness is mentioned. When we think about godliness, we're thinking about that which pleases God, that which is in accord with who God is and puts us in harmony with Him. Uh, it's not so much being God-like as it is you know, pleasing Him and being in accord with Him. Um, so he, the, the good minister exercises himself for godliness. God, godliness promises the life that now is, you'll have a good life now, and the life that is to come. That is a truth that should be accepted by all and that the good minister should attempt to convey. Look at verse 9. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach. That is, to show a life of godliness and to teach a life of godliness. To this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. So very pointed command exhortation to Timothy. This is what you've got to stick with. Don't get caught up in other things. Others are going to have uh, perhaps a thought of looking down on Timothy because of his relative youth. Don't know exactly how young he, was, he is at this point, but relatively he's a young man. Let no one despise your youth. Let no one do that. Don't allow them to do that. You be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. That's just a great text. Again, this could be one you focus on with the young folks, uh, maybe the uh, older groups. Um, focus on the things that are mentioned there. And then in verse 13, he goes on, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. There is a little bit of discussion and um, sort of vagueness in the words that Paul uses in that you can't really tell if he's talking about give it, giving attention to somebody else reading or Timothy reading himself, but it's a re it seems to reference public reading, whether Timothy's paying attention to it or doing it. He used to give attention to that. Um, and I think maybe even one of the translations says public reading. Uh, to, to exhortation, to encourage, and again to doctrine. And is that the doctrine Timothy teaches or the good doctrine that is being taught? I imagine it's the doctrine Timothy is teaching uh, is, is the way that would go. But in any case, you see the instructions overall there. Jeff, you look like you want to say well, something? I think the word is used one of the time in Acts 13, the point of Barnabas are in and not the city, they're in the synagogue, and the same word is used that if the public reading. Public reading, right. That's the same word here in this Right. It, it is definitely the public reading. It's just a matter, of, and I would say him reading it, but it yes. could be listening to it as, as well. So just pay attention to, the, to that is what he's telling him. Good. Um, he's to use his gifts and talents to their fullness. He says, do not get, neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. I'll say a couple of quick things about this, just for the adults mainly. Um, Timothy is given some sort of gift. We don't know what it was. Was it miraculous? Probably, but... Some of God's gifts are not miraculous. In fact, quite a few of them are not miraculous. But this gift was given to Timothy by prophecy. Some prophet prophesied that he would have this gift. It might have been the gift of uh, public speaking. And Paul knew to pick Timothy out in, you know, 
Acts 14, because a prophet had said this about Timothy. I, that's just a big guess. I have no idea. But whatever it was, Timothy had some special gift that was useful, obviously, in uh, the work of an evangelist. Uh, it's given by the prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Uh, a lot of people want to who doubt the truth of spiritual gifts, miraculous gifts could only be given by the laying on of the hands of the apostles. Want to point to this and say, oh, see, Timothy got this by the laying on of the hands of the eldership. But that's not what it says. He got it by prophecy. The elders approved, if you will, or uh, gave encouragement to him, which the laying on of hands is often a giving of encouragement. Uh, when uh, the people there in, in, in uh, Antioch send off Paul and Barnabas, they lay their hands on them as a, approving their mission, so to speak. And I suspect that an eldership had laid their hands on Timothy to approve his mission of preaching uh, in this way, using his gift. So they didn't give it to him. That's not what this is saying. Uh, and some of the translations do a better job than others conveying that. Yeah. Yes? Could it maybe illustrate with, uh, like if you get a burger with fries, you know, it's alongside. Yeah. It's an addition to it. Right. Uh, through the agency of fries. Right. And that's typically actually how the word with would be used anyway. It's not, not the agency, but something alongside it. Exactly. Uh, so Timothy needs to give himself uh, to his work. Uh, he, verse 15, again, I, I love these passages. Meditate on, on these things. Give yourself entirely to them. Think about these things. Give yourself entirely to, that, to them <clears throat> that your progress can be evident to all. Everybody can see. Uh, that you're improving and progressing. And then verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Look out for yourself. Look out for what you're teaching. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And I just want to tell you that's the, that's the glorious call of being a minister of the gospel of Christ. This verse, that verse means so much to me because I've, I've felt all along that my goal would be to save myself first, really. But that to do that, I was going to have to help save others. And this, this verse just inculcates that whole concept. Um, and for, for our minister of the gospel, I think particularly, it's, um, it's what hits, hits the heart. And you as well, as far as that goes. Oh, go ahead. I think so, yeah. I, I, I don't object at all to, to everyone taking the principles here and applying them. I don't think Paul would either. I think there's some indication of that as we go through. Uh, so, we all have the same responsibility to save ourselves. And try to save others. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. All right, let's move on uh, before I get too long-winded. In, in Chapter 5, um, we'll deal with Um, how we relate to one another as a family in the family of God. Um, he starts out just saying, basically, have appropriate regard for age and gender in God's family. Don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. The not to be confused, the not but construction there in the beginning of verse 1 uh, doesn't mean, so it's, it's, he's not saying don't ever rebuke an older man. In fact, he'll give instructions for times where he might have to rebuke an elder in the church a little bit later on. But your, your basic focus and approach with an older man is to approach him as you would a father, uh, you know, with that sort of uh, deference and love. And younger men as brothers and older women as sisters. And younger women as older women as mothers and younger women as sisters. Uh, again, and he adds with all purity. And, of course, one of the problems that's been, uh, I, I guess, for, for maybe as far back as the first century, is preachers, uh, you know, committing adultery, uh, all of those things, the kinds of things in churches. And uh, obviously it's a huge problem in denominationalism, but it has been some in the Lord's Church as well. And I think a key to that overcoming that is what if you if if the evangelist will look at the young sisters as as his sisters 
with all purity and see them in that light, then uh, it becomes a lot easier to handle and temptation uh, is lessened. I think there's a point to be made there. It talks about honoring widows. We're not going to have time to look all through this uh, in detail. So let me see how I can condense it. Widows deserve to be honored, uh, those who are Christians. Um, if they have children or grandchildren, those children or grandchildren uh, should be first in caring for them, he will say. Uh, children have an obligation to repay their parents for their raising. You might remember Jesus talking about the command to honor your parents and some of the Pharisees thought, well, they could take money that they could have honored their parents with and helped their aged parents with. They could take that and give it to the temple instead, say it's Corban, and so they could get around honoring their parents. Jesus condemns them for that. You should take care of your parents in their age. And this is also, if anybody has any of my children or grandchildren in your class, make sure to focus on that. <laughs> but this is, this is something God expects of us as, as children. I think most of us understand that, but that's what's being said here, and we need to convey it. Um, it's part of honoring your parents. Uh, widows who are truly alone uh, and, and living lives of faith should be given these special consideration, including being helped regularly by the church out of the treasury or whatever, um, and, and that's fitting and proper. So there, there are people, there are women who've met certain uh, qualifications, certain age, and they've uh, helped the saints and served uh, regularly and all that sort of thing. They can be uh, helped all along. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a widow who is living in pleasure or indulgence, one translation says, that she's dead while she lives. You don't want to support that, obviously. Uh, but a, a widow who has lived a good life and is living a good life along these lines can be can be supported by the church. Younger widows are not to be given this sort of consideration. If we look at verse 11, refuse the younger widows. When they begin to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they've cast off their faith. Besides, be idle, walking about from house to house, not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. So you've got a younger widow, probably without any children, because he advises them to marry and bear children. So here's a young uh, woman widow uh, having probably no children yet or anything and he's saying you're not going to support her to just run around and be a busybody and live a life of indulgence and, and wantonness and all that sort of thing she's to, remar she's to remarry and raise a house and manage the family and care for her children and do the things that a young woman uh, should do if possible um, but then in verse 16 he says, if any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them and do not let the church be burdened. Let them relieve those who are really widows. So here's one passage we go to that very plainly shows there's a distinction between church responsibility and individual responsibility. Here's something that's denied by almost all of our institutional brethren, that there is no distinction to be made between church and individual responsibility. If you, can't, if you don't get anything else out of that verse, make sure you get that. There's a clear distinction to be made. Um, you know, I talked to my brother-in-law, who's a, one of my brother-in-laws who's an institutional preacher about this. He doesn't have an answer for it, really. He just, you know, just go. But there's a clear distinction to be made. All right. Um, Paul goes on and talks to Timothy about how to deal with, with elders, uh, those who are ruling well, uh, those who sin and brethren generally. He says, uh, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and in doctrine. Uh, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Anybody know where that is quoted in the New Testament? It's from the Old Testament. Anybody know where else it's quoted in the New Testament and about what? Does it sound familiar? 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9 about Paul's right to be supported. Yeah, preacher's right to be supported. So Paul's using the same passage, same, same concept, saying elders are worthy of double honor. The only conclusion I make from that is those that labor in teaching and preaching who are elders, uh, in practical terms, it means that they may be supported uh, to to preach the gospel or to, to, to do what they're doing. 
Um, and they're, they're very worthy of that. Uh, again, he uses the same reasoning, same verse, same verses to make that point. Here is 1 Corinthians 9, 9 through 14 is where that is. Uh, Timothy needs to be cautious and uh, respectful in dealing with elders. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. So we need to be cautious and, and respectful of our elders here, uh, for sure, uh, with the position they have, the Holy Spirit having placed them in that position, uh, and the authority they have, the fact that there are shepherds, all of that. So don't receive an accusation against them except by two or three witnesses. If it's confirmed that they're sinning, he says, rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may fear. I think if, if it is confirmed that uh, an elder is guilty of sin, that needs to come out in public, and the, the uh, correction needs to be made publicly. Uh, so that all may realize nobody's above that, uh, and and it's the it's the right way to handle it. Timothy's to observe these things without partiality. You know, I don't know if he's talking about just the dealing with the elders, dealing with elders and widows, or all the way back through the rest of the uh, epistle. But I expect that he's at least thinking of dealing with elders and dealing with widows, and so you don't know, sow favoritism. Uh, you're going to do this with one, but not do this with the other, that kind of thing. Ended all the way through that. Uh, avoid, he says, uh, participating in the sins of others. Verse 22. I think this is, again, a, a great verse. There are a lot of just nuggets in here. Young people need to get in there. This is one of them. Not lay hands on anyone hastily. That's the approval. Don't give your approval, your fellowship necessarily, to anybody uh, hastily. Uh, nor share in other people's sins. Don't approve of anybody who's living in sin, doing that which is sinful, lest you inadvertently fellowship. And the word partaker there is a fellowshipper of their sins. So be cautious about that. You can partake of other people's sins by approving of them while they're in sin or by committing a sin with them. So that's two ways young people need to be careful about. We all do, but especially I think young folks need to be careful about um, participating in the sins of others. I'll just say in passing, as Paul seems to do, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. So the word little there <laughs> is important and the medicinal purpose of it is important. Um, and that's what he instructs. And I don't think anybody has a bone to pick with that. Um, Could we not from that one verse alone prove what was Timothy's normal course? Yeah. I, I, not to drink. Right. It's evident that he wasn't drinking any wine at all. Uh, and that's a, you know, what a strange thing. Because everybody was drinking wine all the time. No, they weren't. <laughs> uh, anyway, good point, Jeff. Appreciate that. Um, so in the end of the chapter, he just talks about, well, you know, some people's sins you're going to be able to see, obviously. Others, uh, not so much. Uh, but uh, all that will come out in the wash, so to speak. Doug? At the end of verse 23, where it says you're frequent infirmity. Yeah. Do you think Timothy had a physical concern that the reason he would put this in here? Yeah, I do. I think uh, maybe he just got sick a lot, or maybe he had some sort of, you know, regular kind of issue, stomach problem, which would it would have been very common in ancient times with the kind of diet and water stuff like that they had to drink. So yeah, could be either one or both. Uh, and you know, grape juice is good for you. Drink. Um, all right, quickly into chapter six. Uh, bond servants are to obey their masters, uh, especially those who are their brethren. All of that to the glory of God. In chapter six and verse three, then he gets again on false teachers uh, a little bit. He says, if anyone teaches otherwise, does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords to godliness. Notice that again, the doctrine which accords with godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which, some, from, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt mind and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. So, the bottom line of all of that is that those who reject the doctrine of godliness must themselves be rejected. Okay? 
They've got lots of problems. They refuse instruction because of their pride. They won't learn anything. Uh, and that results in strife and ugly words and evil suspicions and slander and all of that, all of which is sinful. So Timothy's just told, look, if you've got somebody that's just you know, tooth and toenail against the truth, they won't accept it. They're prideful. They're saying things opposite of what you're saying all the time. They're leading people into division and strife and all that kind of thing. You've got to withdraw from that person. You've got to withdraw from that person. What other comment about that? He's, he's instructed to, to do that. And that would be the same kind of withdrawal as 1 Corinthians 5, uh, you know, 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, same kinds of things, cutting off social interaction. Godliness with contentment is great, is great gain. Uh, again, the word godliness, so often in this section. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. It is certain that we'll carry nothing out. Having food and clothing with these we shall be content. And you know, the question for me is, and for all of us, really? Are we content with food and clothing? Uh, it's, it's easy for me to think about my Zimbabwe brethren who seem to be constantly asking for more, to say to them, you should be content with such things as you have, <laughs> when uh, we all have way so much more. Right, right, to mirror on the wall, exactly. Um, you know, yeah, look, look, let's look at ourselves there. And that's a, an important lesson for all of us, I think, in, in our day and time in our world. The desire for riches, and it doesn't matter if you're in Zimbabwe or America, the desire for, for riches is, is destructive. It results again like a seared conscience. Uh, the desire for riches will result in straying from the faith. Same kind of problem uh, and many sorrows and eternal destruction. Uh, and so you have that very strong warning against that in verses 9 through 10. And then he turns back to Timothy and he says, um, You, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness again, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. But while he's being loving and patient and gentle, guess what he's supposed to do? Fight the good fight. It's a fight. It's like what he said in chapter 1. Wage the warfare. Wage the warfare. Chapter 1 and verse 18. Uh, so this, this involves, if you just look at the verses, um, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life to which you were called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Okay, well what is the good confession? Hold on. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and, and before Jesus Christ who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. When Jesus was before Pilate, Pilate asked him, are you a king? And Jesus responds, you say rightly that I am a king. So look where this goes. That's the good confession. What had Timothy then confessed? Christ is king. You follow that? But then look at where this goes. He says, you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You see where it so all the way through that, the confession and the adherence to the confession that Christ is king. Christ is Lord of my life. He's my absolute uh, monarch. He alone has immortality, dwelling in inapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Just a strong, strong verse of Timothy to hold fast to his confession and reminding him of exactly what that is. Timothy is to command those who are rich not to be haughty, high-minded. Um, he is uh, to teach them to share and again, I, that's one of the responsibilities of preachers, I think, is to teach the wealthy to share. That's um, something I try to do and point four fingers back at myself when I do it. Um, and I realize that, as I've said many times, most of the people I preach to in this country are in that, in that category from a worldwide standpoint. So Timothy has to guard the gospel of godliness that was entrusted to him. Uh, the last part of this 
O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings, contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, by professing it, some have strayed from the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. So hold this doctrine. Hold this doctrine of godliness that I've delivered to you. You keep hold of that. Don't let anything dissuade you from it, whether it's riches or you know, false doctrine or the undermining of Satan or whatever it might be. You hold that. Um, and he says, people have lost you know, their faith by believing this kind of talk. I really like the CEV version. Uh, where he t- he's told to guard the, guard the gospel of godliness against talk that the CEV says sounds smart but really isn't. Sounds smart. That's a whole lot of stuff in the world today, isn't it? And we'll put a scientific study behind this or we'll say Dr. So-and-so says this or whoever and that's supposed to make it legit. Sounds smart but really isn't. Okay. Guard their armor. Keep things not protected. Yeah. Protect the truth. Protect the sure truth. Exactly. So the, the easy sort of big rock bullet points, some are going to depart from the faith. A good minister will teach sound doctrine and leave as an example. Uh, in God's house, we have to treat one another and should with loving respect as family members. Widows should be honored, cared for by their families or by church if needed. Elders must be honored. And we must pursue godliness, not wealth or material gain. Those are just some of the big rocks. All right, anything else before we end? Thanks for hanging with me. I think we made it. All right, chapters 1 and 2 of 2 Timothy. Read it beforehand. Chapters 1 and 2 of 2 Timothy, Sunday morning. Don't come in here unprepared.